From Philadelphia, the city that pulsates with the beat and the rhythms of yesterday and today, it's time for the Geeter with the Heater, the boss with the hot sauce, Cherry Blavitt. 60 seconds make one minute, 60 minutes make one hour, 24 hours make one day, and out of that 24 hours, two and a half hours are dedicated by the young teenager to the hip this show on the radio. So without further ado, let's carry on through now. Five, four, three. Two, one, blast off! Young teenager, gather round. Oh, to the sound I'm a putting back. Come on, baby, let the good time roll. Come on, baby, let me thrill your soul. Come on, baby, let the good time roll. Roll on and on. Well. Where are you? You're looking extremely well. How you doing? Once again, let me say greetings and salutations. And it is such a pleasure for me to welcome you again to our chats. Now, before I chat with this guy, I want to thank you all out there who've been watching every Sunday when we do this with so many of the great stars that have been a part of our lives. And, uh, you know... I've said this to you all the time, even though I don't see you, you know, I miss you. And the only way we connect is with the chats that we do or by the music that I play for you when I'm on the radio. As you know, we're on every day from three o'clock up until five o'clock, WBCB up there in the Trenton area, as you know, Bucks County. And we do it from three to five WBCP. <laughs> then from five o'clock up until seven, you've got me on cruising 92.1. And also up there in the Lehigh Valley, WISL. And then again, another reminder, from 7 to 9, you have me. 7 to 9 in Atlantic City, South Jersey, North Jersey, a place called Cool 93. Now, I want you to listen to this voice. This is probably the last of the crooners. Back in the day, of course, Johnny Mathis is still with us and doing what he does so well. But this was the voice. See if you can recognize this music. David? Can I hear it? Here we go. And then you say hello. And I can hardly speak. My heart is beating so. And anyone could tell. You think you know me well, but you don't know me. The original, as you know, was by Eddie Arnold. I know, I know, I, I need, need someone. 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 Someone to hold each night. For lovers only, the CD. Someone to Darling, can that someone, someone be you? <laughs> Make me leave my happy home. You took my love and now you've gone. Since I fell. The legendary Buddy Johnson wrote that in 1951. Since I fell uh. for you. Two Jane Morgan also had a version of that. Wow. 
That's the version. Don't leave my heart in misery. Neil Sedak originated that upbeat. But Neil, when he heard this version, he had to go back into the studio and he re recorded it. <laughs> wow. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said, the last of the crooners. There's not enough time for me to tell you about Lenny Walsh, but I'm going to try it. Lenny, are you there? My man. I'm <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> hey, Len. <laughs> What happens when you hear that music that I just played for you? Uh, well, to tell you the truth, I, can, I got goosebumps to tell you the truth. I'm not lying about that. It takes me way back. Well, how old were you when you first began? I, I, I know that uh, everyone knows you're from Asbury Park, but how did it all begin for you in a musical career? How old? Oh, I guess I was about 15. Uh huh. And um, I wasn't interested in becoming a singer. I had no idea I'd ever be a singer. Mm -hmm. And uh, a young fellow in my hometown uh, stopped me one day and said, He said, I'm going to start a singing group and I want you to be in it. And I'm saying, well, What do you mean? How do you, know? <laughs> How do you know I can sing? I never sang anywhere except in my in my kitchen listening to the radio and uh so i figured he must have heard me sing while i was walking down the street maybe he heard me singing to myself mm -hmm. was, uh, he always every time he saw me he would ask me to sing in his group he said i'm going to start a singing group and i want you to be in it uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, uh, i used to hide from him <laughs> Every time I saw him coming, I'd go around the corner because <laughs> I didn't want to be bothered, you know. Who? And then we wound up going to the same high school. Uh -huh. and one day, sitting in the uh, gymnasium, we're supposed to be having a study period, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I heard some guys singing. And I, the guys I was sitting with, uh, said, I asked them. I said, "Who is that uh, singing?" I said, "They really sound good." <laughs> and uh, he said, well, that's Joe, Joe Major. I said, well, that's the guy that's been asking me to sing in his group. So I went over, and because there was a crowd around him and mm -hmm. a couple of other guys, and I walked over where they were, and he looked up and saw me and motioned for me to join in. <laughs> well, I did, and that's how it all started. And he told me then, he said, look, tonight I'm going to have a, an audition at my house in the basement. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to have guys come over and audition for the group. He said, you're going to be in it. Yes. I said, okay. So sure enough, that's how it started. How did, how did you get hooked up with uh, one of the great labels? Uh, Archie Blyer, for you people out there, was the musical conductor for Arthur Goffrey. And he started a label called the Cadence Label. And on that label, you had the Cordettes, you had Joyce LaRosa, and you had... Lenny Welsh. Now, how did you hook up with Archie Blyer, who was one of the most famous names in the industry at that time? Well, as you know, my dad is uh, Coley Wallace. Uh, he was a professional fighter. In the Joey and, Lewis story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he played, played in the Joey Lewis story. He played Joe, Joe Lewis in the Joe Lewis story, the movie. And uh, he adopted me. He was not my biological father, but he adopted me when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, he introduced me to a disc jockey, and uh, they were my managers. And uh -huh. the disc jockey took me up to see Archie Blair, and he told me, I must have been about 18 or 19 at the time, and he, mm -hmm. the disc jockey told me, he said, look, Archie Blair, 
uh, only puts out hit records. He, he may wait a year before he puts out a record, but if he puts one out, you can bet it's going to make some noise. Yeah. So he took me up to see Archie, and uh, Archie took me over to the piano, and, and he played You Don't Know Me for me. And uh, he said, I want to hear you sing this. Well, I was trying to sing it nice and pretty, like uh, uh, Johnny Mathis or, yeah. you know, Tony Bennett or something. He said, no, no. He said, I want to hear you do it, sing it like you were singing if you were singing with that group back in Asbury Park. Uh -huh. <laughs> I said, oh, so you want me to put some soul in it. <laughs> so well, I started singing, and he said, yeah, 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 that's it, that's it. But did, you, did you know, did you said, know it, was, uh, it was a country song originally? Did you yeah, know it was yeah, country? Yeah. yeah, so he, he, you know, he started playing it nice and pretty. You yeah. know, I put a little soul to it. <laughs> so he turned around, he turned to my manager, and he said, I want to sign him up. He said, I'll sign him up, we'll go in the studio next week, and that's what happened. We went in the studio next week, and uh, we recorded You Don't Know Me. That was my first, my, first, uh, my first chart record. However, I did record for, um, for uh, Decca Records prior to that, uh -huh. but nothing happened. Uh, I recorded a song called uh, Rocket to the Moon, and the flip side was a song that one of my friends back in Asbury Park had written. It was called uh, My One Sincere. Oh, I love that. You, you know, <laughs> I play more, more songs. You see, yeah. I have the freedom, as you see, this is my studio, Len. So I have the freedom to play music that nobody else plays. And I play <laughs> everything that, that, that you made. I mean, I think the early days with Cadence... And by the way, did you ever do, because Archie was Arthur Goffrey's musical director, did you ever do the Arthur Goffrey show? Did you ever no, put, I never did. You never did no. that? No? no. Because you know, he had the Cordettes on that show, he had Joyce oh, yeah. LaRosa. All of the stable of artists that record on Cadence will wind up being yep. on the Goffrey show. After yep. You Don't Know Me, the next song. What was the next one you recorded? Oh, the next one, after you don't know me, um, see, I recorded quite a few songs, but they, they didn't do anything, but I, I'm trying to remember what, what, uh, I did Ebb Tide, oh. but Ebb Tide, that was on an album. I did a lot of songs that he did, that didn't really do anything, but he put them all on an album. Uh -huh. Once I cut Since I Fell For You, then he put everything together and, uh, and it came out on an album, but, uh, -huh. uh I think Eptide came after uh, Since I Fell For You because there was a woman in in, um, in Hartford, Connecticut. She was a program director her name was Bertha Porter, I think it was. And she she started playing Eptide and uh, it started going up the charts. And, he, and Archie said, well, this is a proven record, so let's, yeah. this will be your next yeah. release. Now, prior to that, I had recorded uh, a song called uh, Changa Rock, and that was a, it was a hit in Puerto Rico. Yeah. This, this had to be 1960, something like that. And uh, it was, uh, during that time, there was a dance called La Pachanga, and I put that record out called uh, Changa Rock, <coughs> excuse me. And I wound up going to Puerto Rico when I was a hit in Puerto Rico. <laughs> and I used to hang out. Guess who I hung out with? I hung out with Sam Cooke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was working at the Caribe Hilton. Oh, yeah. And and I, I was about, that was just after I did You Don't Know Me, about 1959, something like that. And Sam Cooke was working at the El San Juan. Yep, right up so, the street. Yeah, right. And 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 uh, every evening after we finished performing, we would go into uh, into uh, San Juan to a to a club called La Pachea. Yeah. La Pachanga, La Pachea. Yeah. The bottle in English it's called the bottle. And uh, we would hang out there all night long. Do you know? So, do you know that the Carib Hilton Hotel was built in 1952, and when Castro came in to Puerto Rico and they stopped gambling. The Carib Hilton was the ho first hotel in Puerto Rico 
to do gambling. It was a magnificent hotel, if you remember. It had its own little bay. As a matter of fact, the yeah. Navy Yard was right ad adjusted to it. Remember that? Yes, yes, uh, yes. Now, let me ask you this question. Since I fell for you, as you know, was Buddy Johnson, the great orchestra leader, who his sister Ella Johnson. And when you want to talk about talented people, Red Prysock played with Buddy Johnson. Arthur yeah. Prysock played with Buddy Johnson. Now, when you get that piece of materials, since I fell for you, man, and you just changed the whole structure, man. I mean, that's got to be like a winning thing in your mind, pal. Well, now, there's a story there. Um, the group that I sang with in Asbury Park, we were called the Marquees. Now, we never had any hit records, but I understand there's a group that did have some hit records by the name of the Marquees. Mm -hmm. But that group that I sang with, well, they, they were my heart. They were my life. You know, it, um, I'm so happy that that guy asked me to join his group because they brought such joy to me. And, uh, and I had... I think I'd heard Since I Fell For You a few times before, but it was always done in a blues uh, mm -hmm. fashion, a uh, really heavy gut bucket blues. But when my buddy got the record, he got the record from um, of the Harkdom, Willie, Willie Winfield and the Harkdoms. Yep, They did it originally, <laughs> yes. Yeah, and uh, we used to sing, we used to, I used to copy Willie doing the song, you know. So when I moved to New York and I met with Archie Blair, Archie would always ask, is there a song that really means something to you, maybe that you sang with the group back in, in your hometown? Is it a song that really sticks out to you? I said, yes, yeah, song called Since I Fell For You. So uh, he went out and got the sheet music and he came back and he played it. Now, I'd never heard that front part before. You know, he said, when you just get it, well, that wasn't, Willie Winfield didn't do it. Like no, nope. No. So it, it, it didn't ring a bell with me, but later on when he got to, you made me leave my happy home, then that made sense. You know, I said, oh. So now Archie, he's a, a, a pianist and conductor, arranger who is familiar with, Mozart and all that high fashion stuff and he's playing it real sweet and pretty so I fell into it you know I just fell into what he was doing and uh, the way he was playing it but I also released my heart my soul and, uh, you know I was upset with a young lady at the time and uh, <laughs> I ain't gonna lie <laughs> listen you know something you just Archie you're talking about Archie Bell and you Archie Bell Archie Bryant these were the visionary guys, I think, Lenny, in our business that knew if you had talent, knew exactly what to do with the talent. And yeah. he, he knew what he wanted to do with you, man, because you were a crooner. Everything yeah. that you did was with soul, man, you know? Yeah, well, you know when, when, when I moved to New York, I didn't want to be a solo artist. I was looking for a group. I wanted to sing with a group like the Cadillacs, the Moon Glows, the Heart Tones, the, Dells, you know, the Spaniels. The solo artists. But that's, I fell into it. I, I'll tell you how that happened. Uh, Coley Wallace, he took me to an audition. This is before I got with Archie. To an audition at Decca Records. And uh, I'm sitting there. I, you know, I said, I'm not going to audition. I just want to see what the procedure is. So I sat there. I'm sitting there watching them, all these different groups perform and, and audition. And I'm just sitting there enjoying myself. And a woman comes up to me and she says, uh, what's your name? So I told her my name. My real name and my birth name is Leon. Leon Welch. I told her. You know, and I'm sitting there watching them perform and then she comes over to me and she says, you next. I said, me? <laughs> I'm not interested in, in auditions. She says, no, no. So some of my friends there, a couple of guys I had met earlier, and they, they could really sing. They said, look, we'll back you up. I said, okay, what the heck? I dumped up and I sang, uh, I sang Stardust. And uh, I sat down and I just enjoyed it. And I figured that was it. When the auditions were over, when everybody was, was finished, 
I heard Lenny Welch, Lenny Welch. I'm looking around saying, who the heck is Lenny Welch? <laughs> I said, somebody's here with my last name, you know? <laughs> so the producer comes over to me and he says, you, you. I said, me? I said, well, my name's Liam. He said, well, I think Lenny sounds better. And I was 18 years old at the time, and I've had that name ever since. No more so, Leon. It's Lenny Welsh. <laughs> that's right. And, and, and that's when he signed me up, and I, and I cut my first record, which was, as I said, uh, Rocket to the Moon. Yeah, yeah. That, they did that because it was a gimmicky thing because Sputnik had just gone up. Yeah. And as I said, the flip side was my I, one sincere. My one sincere. Now, a lot of people tell me that they love that song. I said, like, wow, you know, this is really something. Now, you, you know, I know, I know I need someone. That was the B side, as you know. Yeah, that was the flip side of You Don't Know Me. Exactly. Now, I tell you what happened. When I first went on radio, and nobody was playing that. Nobody was playing that at that time. And you know, because you've been in Philadelphia with me, and you did the cruise with me. We're going to talk about the Malt Shop Memories cruise in a little bit. But I used to... Wait, 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 wait. You know, I remember coming to Philadelphia and co-hosting your TV show. Yes, indeed. I used to come from New York every day and go back and have a co-host with you. Yeah, right. We did a five-day week show. We did yep. it from 1966 to 1970. But what happened, I got the idea. I used to do For Lovers Only on the radio where I would play music and relate a story to the lyric with the song. And I needed something to open up the hour where kids were late at night in their bed. And for me to kick it off, I said, every kid that goes to the dance, dances with someone. They fall in love with someone. They need someone. And when I heard <laughs> I know, I know, I need someone. Finish a little bit more of the opening of that song for me. Go ahead. Go ahead. Someone to hold each night. Someone to squeeze real, real tight. Darling, can that someone be you? And that's what a kid felt like when he went home after dancing with the girl. And that yeah. became the biggest song in an album that I made called For Lovers Only. Uh, you know, there's so many wonderful stories about you. The Malt Shop Memories Cruise, if you recall when you were on it, it was you, it was Eddie Holman, and yeah. Terry Johnson of the Flamingos. Yeah. And, and when uh, you got and up, you, yeah, when and you, you did. yeah, but yeah. we called it the three. It was called the three solo tenors, basically, if you remember, yeah. right? Good. Yeah. You got up there, and when you did, I know, I know, I need someone. The folks from Philadelphia went crazy because that was really the Philadelphia song. And, you know, talking about the cruise, what do you think of those cruises that the Mall Shop Memories people do? Aren't they wonderful, Lenny, that brings our people together? That was just, I'll never forget that. That was one of the best times of my life. You know, uh, I'll never forget, we were sitting, after the cruise was over, we were sitting in the in the cafeteria, all, all of us, I think with Joey D, Terry Johnson, Eddie Holman, myself. We were sitting at a table and people would come up and ask for autographs. And uh, uh, then when we finished, we got to got to we were leaving the, uh, the uh, yep. cafeteria. Somebody stood up and started to applaud, and then before you know it, the, everybody in the place had, was standing up, applauding us as we left. And I, man, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it now. You know, it was one of the best times of my life. I'll you know. Forget. You know, it's. It, I said it to the audience out there, and of course for you people out there, we didn't go out this year. We're going out next year. And if you really want to relive the music of the great artists, which Lenny is one of them, and the Beach Boys, and Dionne Warwick, and of course this next cruise, as you know, will be with Gladys Knight, and of course the Righteous Brothers will be on the cruise, and Mary Wilson will be on the cruise. 
It's October the 30th through November the 6th, and it's 2021. Now, if you call right away, you can get a discount if you mention Lenny Walsh's name or mention my name. These shows, remember, it's a lifetime experience. And the wonderful thing, Len, about the people that go on this cruise, they come back again and again. And you know, Len, you know what's also wonderful about your career? When young people hear and see you perform those songs, they fall in love. Because young people today, to them, to us, it's old. But nothing's old. If it's good, it's new. So that's got to be wonderful for you to know that through all of the works that you've done, through generation after generation, young people are picking up that music. You are truly a crooner. You know that, don't you? Yeah. yeah but, uh, what can I say, man? I, I'm, I'm so happy to, to uh, Listen, know this. Uh, matter of fact, I had a young guy, he told me he was 21, sent me an email. Uh, on, uh, I'm on Facebook, so he yeah. sent me an email. And he, he said, I'd like to ask you some questions. He said, I'm a big fan of you and the artists from the 50s and 60s. And he says, a lot of my friends are into it. He said, I really mean they're really into it, man. I said, really? He <laughs> said, yeah. And he said, I want to get some information. Who are the musicians that played on Since I Fell For You and some of the other records? He said, you get all the information about other you know, other artists and, and uh, who the musicians were, but you never know who these musicians yeah. were that played yeah. you, for the artists of, yeah. back in the day. So I, I I wish I could have helped him, but, you know, they were studio musicians, and I just didn't know. That was too far back, you know, 1963 yeah. and 64. That's too far from me. <laughs> well, you know, back in the day, you know, all, all of the cats that did studio work also worked for Basie, they also worked for Duke Ellington. These were side musicians that also played. I mean, the great drummers going back there. I mean, you know, you go, you go with horn guys. You go with the great guitarist and Phil Upchurch, and you go with Buddy Johnson, you know, and you go with, I can go on and on and on. So there were so many great session players that yeah, actually yeah. worked with Basie yeah. and Duke Ellington. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Now, and there, was a, there was a drummer named... Uh, Bernard Purdy Purdy, he played with me, played a lot of my stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, <clears throat> oh, I don't, I, you know, also, I, I told him that back in those days, there was there was no overdubbing. No. But, you no. know, when you, we all sang it, we sang, to, we recorded together, the orchestra, yeah. the singer. Yeah. When I did it, if somebody made a mistake, everybody stopped and did it again. If the bass player made a mistake, everybody stopped and we did it again, you know. There was no overdubbing. Everything was live. Yeah, yeah. That was beautiful. Well, you know, you know, Sinatra, you know, when he would go into the studio, you know, pop, 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 and he'd take a hat off a little bit, man, unbutton the bow tie, all the tie, and he said, let's go. And after three or four sessions, after takes, if they didn't get it, he said, I'll, I'll see you later on. I mean, that's the way it used to be back in those days. You know? yeah. <laughs> Listen, if you didn't become a singer, what career would you have chosen? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I often think about that. <laughs> I have no idea. You know, I have, I wish, I, well... I can remember when I was about 11 years old trying to figure out what I would do later on in life. And I, I always wanted to be, a, have own a business, be an entrepreneur, you know, mm -hmm. trying to figure out how I would get enough money together to start my own business. That's when I was 11 years old, but I never knew how I would do it. And uh, I guess uh, as in my teenage years before I got with that singing group, um, I guess I would have just figured on uh, going into the service and learning a trade. That was it, you know. Well, yeah. well, thank you, God for, for the guy that uh, got me going, this, asked me to join his group. And that's, that's the only reason I, I became a singer. 
Well, you, you did go into the service for a brief period of time, right? Yeah. yeah, you, you yeah. The service. Now, when you were in the service, were you singing singing with the guys? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was. Yes, I was. I can recall, I can recall very well being on, on, uh, on KP mm -hmm. and uh, I'm sitting there washing dishes as the guys <laughs> were going through the guys with that. Hey, that's that guy that sings since I fell for yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd roll my eyes at him and continue washing and picking up the dirty dishes and stuff. Yeah. You but know, I had a ball. Yeah, I used to sing. I used to sing in, <laughs> for the fellas. You know, I, I, I go back. I, we're talking about you're very fortunate to have had two major labels that signed you, Cadence and then Cap, K-A-P-P, -P, yeah. which had, as yeah. you remember, Jane Morgan. Most artists back in the other day had little labels Okay, you know, Chess, Checker, VJ, but these were major labels that you recorded on, you know, and you had great yeah. material going back then. Uh, yeah. When you did uh, uh, Darling Take Me Back, you remember that yeah. one? It, it, yeah. Originally, that was Ray Pollard who used to sing with the Wanderers. Yes. You know, yes, and you yes, did. I think he had he had a hit with it in Philadelphia, and I had a hit with it in New York. You had a hit nationally <laughs> with it in New York. City. Yeah, but but I think I think he had an edge on me in Philadelphia. <laughs> well, not with me. <laughs> <laughs> Your favorite songs when you were recording for David Cap back then. Your your songs. Were, yeah. you what know, was my favorite? Yes, with uh, Ebb Tide. No, no, Eptide was with, uh, with uh, Archie Blair. Was with Archie, uh, okay. My favorite, my favorite with, uh, with Cap, I think, was uh, Darling Take Me Back, I'm right, Sorry. Right, right, right. And, right. and, and it also... Um, well... Uh, two Different Worlds. That's the one. T two Different Worlds. Let me hear do it. Do it. Right. Do it. Two right. Different Worlds. Two Different Worlds. We live in two different worlds. Wow. Jane Morgan also had that too, you know. She was married to Jerry Weintraub, who was managing Sinatra later on in the career. Now, Neil Sedaka. Yeah. Breaking up is hard to do. Tell me the story yeah. about that. Because I let you, you know that Neil originally had it as a dum dum de dum dum ba bum bum. That's right. That's How right. did you That's change right. the whole thing? Well, um, I was in California. Uh, you know, was running around out there doing shows, and my producer called me from New York. And she said, "I got your next hit record." Said, yeah, okay. So when I got back to New York, she played uh, "Breaking Up Is Hard to Do" for me. And now she was uh, she was very close fl close friends with Neil Sedak and, uh, and his writer. I think his name was Howie Greenfield. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah. And uh, so she knew them, and uh, she started playing it, playing it slow. I'd never heard it done that way before. And I said, wow, this is very similar to Since I Fell For You. So uh, we made a demo and um, took it around to different places and different record companies, and I think the Commonwealth United decided to uh, put it out. So well, that's how that how that came about. And uh, when I was in England, I called. This is some time later. Uh, I had called uh, Neil when he was in England also, and I asked him if he'd be interested in uh, producing me. And he said that he was uh, uh, busy recording his daughter. Right. He was able to do it. So that's how breaking up is hard to do. Well, came about. How? But then he went back into the studio and re-recorded it with yeah. your with your style, man. With with, yeah, with yeah. not the dum dum de doom 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 doom. Because that was <laughs> bubblegum originally the way he did it. You yeah. made it into a love song and then he realized oh, I want to do it like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, whenever he went on um, on the late night T V shows like the Johnny Carson show and so forth. He always mentioned me. He always said that uh, that uh, I had recorded it first as a ballad. Right, right, right. His was an up-tempo thing. Well, you know, you also did some acting too. 
I mean, you, your dad, you know, was an actor, but you did some acting, and I think you did some TV uh, 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 soap operas. Did you do some of that yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah, I was on um, a General Hospital a few times. Uh huh. Uh huh. You, you know who loved soap operas? Sammy Davis. Sammy, oh, would, stay, oh, yeah. Sammy would stay in his room. And from 10 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the afternoon, look at all those soap operas that are on. He was hooked on soap operas. <laughs> you know, there was another song that I did. A lot of people uh, uh, comment on it. And, and it's kind of funny because people are coming up commenting on songs that, that weren't hits, but they were on some of my albums. And they're saying, oh, man. I really loved your version of so and so. I'm saying, well, I wish they had put it out so it could have been a hit, you know? But one song was uh, A Taste of Honey. Oh, yeah. And I, yeah. And I did the first uh, uh, first version that had lyrics. Um, who was it um, that did the instrumental? You know who that Herb yeah. Alpert also did A Taste yes, of Herb Honey. Yep, yep, yes, Herb Alpert. Yep, 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 yep. But I did the first version with lyrics, and uh, I was working in England once, and uh, my piano player was teaching uh, Paul McCartney's wife how to play piano, and this is his first wife. I mm -hmm. think she passed away. And uh, so when he wasn't working with me, he was teaching Paul's wife, giving her lessons. And uh, one day he was there and Paul McCartney asked me, he said, what are you doing these days? He said, well, I'm working with this American singer named Lenny Welch. He said, oh, we know of him. We recorded uh, A Taste of Honey because we heard his version. Yeah. We listened to one of his albums, we heard uh, his version. That's why we recorded A Taste of Honey. Now, he also said it in a, in a book that he wrote, mentioned that they, they recorded A Taste of Honey because they heard my version. You know, it, it's interesting. Uh, many people didn't realize that all of the English groups and all of the English artists, they were in awe of our American artists. And at the very beginning, as you knew, the, the Beatles did all the Chuck Berry stuff and Boys by the Shirelles and all that stuff. The American influence all over the world with our music, really, people didn't realize uh, how important our music was. And then when the English invasion came in, well, that sort of put a crump for the American artists because everything on radio, Lenny, back in those days was format radio and everything was English, English, English. And so many of the American artists did not get play because of the fact of the English invasion back in those days. But you, you see, the Four Seasons, you, the Four Tops, American groups, American artists that had something really special. You always came right through, right through. And you know, you talk about Motown. I mean, Motown during the English invasion really popped, I mean, you know, with the Four Tops, the Supremes, Mary Wells, Smokey Robinson, the Marvelettes, Junior Walker. I mean, yeah. it, it was an exciting time for us, yeah. music, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, now you're making me think of some things. I remember working at the Apollo Theater, and uh, my record was uh, number one, and, and uh, Dinah Ross and Supremes were, uh, were performing there also, but they, they were unknown. They had a dressing room next to me, and, and um, uh, Flip Wilson was the MC, <laughs> and uh, they would go out on stage. They opened the show because they were unknown. And uh, I used to always stand in the wings and listen to them. I said, man, they are good. And I never thought they would be as big as they, they, they became, but I knew they were, they were good. They were really, really good. And, and, the, and uh, uh, the comedian was uh, Mom's Maybe. <laughs> oh, my, Mom's. <laughs> they they yeah, didn't know yeah. if Mom's was a boy or a girl. <laughs> You know, the, the the Apollo, when you did that, the first song that they had, Where Did Our Love Go? That was the first song, the first hit song that the Supremes had. And uh, that happened when they were doing the Dick Clark Cavalcade of Stars. And Mary Wilson, who's going to be on the cruise uh, this this time when we go out, told the story yeah. about that, that they were uh, 
on the Dick Clark show and record busted and then they wind up doing the Apollo and, and became big stars. All you need all you need is one record, right, Lenny? That's it. That's it. One record. But it's, it's not easy. No. Not easy at all. Well, you know, there's no more record companies like it used to be back then, Len. Back then no. you, you you could shop a master. You could go yeah. to the Brill building or you can go to New York City, there'd be sixteen different labels. Yeah. And you'd be going from one office to another office to another office, you know. It's it's very difficult today for young people to get in, break into this business. I have no idea how they do it. I just remember how it, how it used to be, uh, as you say, going into the Brill building at 1650 Broadway. Yeah. And uh, I remember when Dionne Warwick was uh, first starting out and she she was unknown at the time I remember seeing her at 1650 Broadway yeah, yeah. and uh, Scepter Records huh? Scepter Records Scepter Scepter Records that was yeah, record. Scepter. right yeah. right that's and she, right that's where the Shirelles were yeah. by, by the way you know her birthday is coming up December the 12th Dion hmm. Warwick will be 80 years old hmm. And you know, yeah, I, I, listen. I got to be. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I ain't going to say how much. <laughs> but you know, when she did the March Up Memories Cruise, and this is another wonderful thing about these cruises, it's just not rock and roll or rhythm and blues or doo wops. It's the complete history of music. On the March Up Memories Cruise, we've had Petula Clark. When I tell you, this young lady was royalty. And the acceptance, the acceptance that she got was phenomenal. As a matter of fact, she said to me, Gita, I never expected this. Because, you know, I was not known as a rock and roller. I said, music is music. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So, as you know, Len, Vaultshot Memory Schools is very important to keep our music alive. Do you agree, Len? I agree 100%. Yeah. As, well, as I said, I've never experienced anything like that in my life from, from the audience. They, they just went crazy. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I, I performed on cruise ships for almost 20 years. Uh -huh. I worked for Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines for, for almost 20 years. And I love working on the cruise ships. This mall shop cruise was was nothing like it. That's all I can say. It's, it, the artists were fabulous. The people were, oh, man. They were just yeah. tremendous. They just had a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous time. I can't, I can, I will never ever forget the experience that I had on Mall Chop. Listen, you will be back with us, okay? I, I promise you. I'm going to talk to Anna Rubin and Janie and Timmy and Jason and everybody and, and, and Mike. You'll be back. As a matter of fact, David, show our audience out there how they can get onto this Mall Chop Memories cruise. Remember, there are limited cabins left. So, ladies and gentlemen, call 844-855-MALT and mention my name, mention Letty's name, and book on this cruise. Len, as we look back at everything, I got, how much time do we have, David? Uh, about 15 minutes. 15 minutes. What... You know, we, we think about the wonderful artists that are no longer with us. Roy Hamilton, who, as you know, set the pace. He's the top. Yes. Set the pace. I saw, I, I saw him at the Apollo Theater when I was when I was about 18, I guess. Man, he was fabulous. What a strong, powerful voice. You know, these artists all came from gospel. When, when you think about that, I mean, Roy Hamilton, you, you go back with, even with Dionne Warwick singing with her sister and Sissy, they were a part of a gospel group back in those days. But Roy Hamilton, to me, never, and you know, he did the original version of Eptide. Yeah, he did, he did Eptide. He yeah. did a fabulous job he, with it. He did that. He also did I Believe, and Frankie Lane yeah. also had the version on that. And, he, he, and what was it? There was another song, uh, You Can Have Her. Oh, yeah. I, I don't want her. And then yeah. one, Don't he, Let Go, Don't Let Go. Hear that right, whistle right, coming right. on that line. Don't Let Go, Don't Let That's Go. Right. And how about You'll Never Walk Alone, the way he oh, did that. Oh, my goodness. Carousel, oh, wow. man. You know. Woo. 
I mean, you know, what, when I was a kid, I used to sneak in. There was a place in Philadelphia called Peps. And yeah. Lenny knows this. I performed there. Yes. I'm questioning. I performed there. Right. Yeah. And, it was a jazz club, wasn't it? Yes, yes, yes. And it used to be called the, the Sepia Circuit. All the black artists used to record at Peps or the Blue Note or the Showboat. Okay. Okay. And yeah. I used to sneak in to see Donna Washington. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And Sarah Vaughan, man. You know, yeah. now, some of these artists had to influence you at an early age, man. You know that? Yeah. Yeah. Who, who were the early, uh, early influences with you? Early influences. Well, well um, I was in, in awe of Clyde McFadden oh. and the Drifters. Oh. When they went, did, when he, I'm talking about way back. I'm talking about when they did, uh, what you gonna do? Honey love, uh, honey love, honey, honey, yeah. honey love. Money honey. Money, 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 honey. Wow. Yeah, songs like that. You know, that's that's what got me going. But I remember I was. You mentioned uh, uh, Dinah Washington. I was performing at the Apollo uh, in uh, with You Don't Know Me, and I was, you know, I wanted to get a standing ovation. So I was doing tricks with my voice. <laughs> I was doing everything, and BB King and Dinah Washington were there. Well, after the show, you know, everybody would go down to a club called the Palms Cafe on 125th Street yeah. and hang out, you know. So they, Diana Washington and B.B. King were there. And uh, that's where I met them and I took a picture with them. And I, you know, I still have that picture. And uh, I remember B.B. telling me, he said, Lenny, I'm going to tell you, just sing the song, Lenny. Forget about the tricks. Just sing the song. And I never forgot it. And two weeks later, uh, I was working with him as his opening act mm -hmm. in uh, in Florida. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was I worked with him for I stayed with him for about a month, and uh, as his opening act. And uh, <laughs> I was just a kid, man. I was what? I was about uh, 19 years old, and. Uh, me and a buddy of mine, we, you know, after I opened the show for him, man, we'd get out there on the dance floor and party with everybody and uh, stay out until the next morning, about <laughs> 9, 10 o'clock in the morning. That's what, that's what we were doing. And we were coming in, you know, and, and, and B.B. had a house, one, and, and, and there was a house that he stayed in, and he had a porch on it. And as we were coming in early in the morning, hung over, and <laughs> he's sitting there having some coffee. And then we look up and see him on the porch. I say, morning, B. <laughs> and B looked at us and said, and you ain't going to make it in this business. You keep doing this. <laughs> and I go in, go to sleep. Listen. And I wouldn't get up until it was time to go and do the show the next night, you know? <laughs> and I mean, this is, you know, I was a young kid. I didn't know. I thought that if you if you could talk, you could sing. But I didn't realize what he was saying until years later. I realized is you can't burn yourself out. You have to get your rest. You have to get to sleep and eat right and so forth. Otherwise, you lose your voice. No, 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 and uh, okay. so <laughs> I'll never forget him. And, and and years later, oh man, many many years later, it, that was in eight fifties, but. Somewhere in the 70s, I think it was about 75, maybe five years ago, just before he passed away, he was in California, and I was living in California at the time, and he was appearing at the Kodak Theater, and I went backstage to see him, and, and he didn't know who I was, and I had a picture of the three of us, B.B. King, Dinah Washington, and myself, and I had that picture, and on the back of the picture, I had written a note saying who I was and so forth. And uh, I was in his dressing room, the press was there, and everybody was, the place was packed. His, his dressing room was packed with people, and I leaned over and I handed him the, the photo. He looked at it, and he turned it over, and he read it, and he said, oh, my God. He said, everybody, shh, shh. He turned to me, he said, this is one of the finest singers in the world. He said, and he looked at me, he said, he said, now I know you had a big hit with Since I Fell For You. He said, but my favorite was You Don't Know Me. Wow, wow. <laughs> and I wish, I wish I had met that, that, 
if I had had a camcord or some kind of camera, I could have filmed that and filmed what he had said, you know. And then I reached him and I shook his hand and I said, B, I said, I don't know if I'm going to see you again. And he said, I, you know, I just wanted to, he said, what do you think I'm going to die? <laughs> I said, no, man. So he gave me his address and so forth in, in, in Las Vegas. So that I had nothing but fond memories of B.B. King. You know, I, I go back with B.B. You know, he was a disc jockey. Did you know that? He was a disc, disc jockey. Yeah, 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 yeah. In Memphis, I think. Right? Yeah, yeah. And he, he used to call me up and say, Gita, the thrill is gone if I don't hear your voice. <laughs> I said, B.B., so I want to hear the way it goes, get her with the hitter, the boss with the hot sauce. So when I interviewed him, I said, B.B., you do that. He said, the get her with the hitter, the boss with the hot sauce. <laughs> you know, the people that we loved in this business are very special people, Lenny, like you and like everybody else. I, I say it to the audience all the time. We're no different than you. You know, we live, we enjoy, we love, we have sicknesses, we have sadness. But the one yeah. thing that keeps us going is the audience out there. Do you agree, Len? Do you agree on that? Amen. 100%. I mean... 100%. When I step on stage and I look out at the audience, I don't... All I see is love. I don't care what if, if you're a Republican, a Democrat, what race you are, what religion you are. When I go out, I just look for love, and I give love. That's all I'm... You give your love to me. Let me hear you do that again. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. You give... <laughs> Say hello. And I can hardly speak. My heart is beating so. And anyone can tell. You think you know me well. But you don't know me. You know him when you see him on stage. <laughs> you know him when he moves. You know him the way he loves through the music. Lenny, thank you. Uh, it's been such an enjoyable hour with you, you know. And uh, I just wish you good health. Keep that smile going, man. And, you know, you and I go back a long, long time. <laughs> Way back. Thanks, and listen, Jerry. And we'll be together again by the grace of God. Amen. My man. Love you, man. Thank you, Len. Thank you, buddy. Ladies and gentlemen, without a doubt, you talk about a gentleman. You talk about a talent. You talk about a star. But more important, a beautiful human being. And I think that you saw that when you saw this interview with Lenny Welsh. I am so blessed and fortunate all of these years to be a part of a family of show business. I never intended to be where I am today. If you read my book, You Only Rock Once, you will see that at an early age, I found dancing, I found music. And that's the way my life has been. Someone said to me, if I had another career to choose, what would I do? And I said it to my grandson, Joseph, and his, his beautiful wife. I would probably would want to be a teacher or maybe even a priest where I could be doing good things and make people happy in my profession. Well, I am not a priest. I'm not a teacher. But I do good things by playing the music and keeping you happy because music takes away the tears, the fears, the sadness, the hurts. Music speaks for where we are, where we're going, and where we should be. And that is truly the life of a performer. Performing, that is my life. And I thank you for being a part of this. And remember, book the Mark Shop Memories Cruise. If you haven't done this yet, do it now. Call Mark Shop Memories Cruise, 844-855. M-A-L-2. More. Love you, David. Thank you very much. Until next week, the Gator, the boss with the hot sauce with the reminder, remember at all times, keep on rocking. Could you really only do rock once?